How many of you are new here at Christmas time, right here at Park City's Baptist Church? This is your first Christmas, but it's just raise your hand. Yes, we're so glad that you're here. Some of you are guests. Maybe you're like, I'm new today. I've met some of you. But um, just know this. You can already sense it. Nothing like Christmas here at Park City's Baptist Church. This is my favorite time of the year. I guess a lot of people could say that. But I, I don't know. It brings about the kid in me. And some of y'all know I'm kind of childlike often, but with childlike wonder and hope and optimism, we, we lean into this, this season and today is a big day. We're kicking it all off from start to finish. And I hope you'll, you'll join in. If you're a member of this church, I would anticipate that you are present throughout this day, through tonight, and even throughout the coming season. As Rodney noted, uh, some of us need to get busy today inviting people to come. I've already invited folks this morning. Come, come be with us tonight and throughout the week. We're inviting people to come. So do that. And I hope that you will. Today is the day. It starts today. So join in. Uh, Julie Plagans wrote today's devotional guide, others, and then staff members, others in our church Dive in. If you're a member of our church, let's go. This is the time. But this is a time of of joy-filled expectation. I think that Christmas reminds us, for me at least, it it takes me back to my childhood, awaiting Christmas Day, all the expectations to come. And in a big and million ways, the Christmas season really is lived out on a daily basis. Great expectation met with unmet expectations. That's the tension of life, isn't it? I don't know if you read Charles Dickens' um, Great Expectations, okay, ninth grade, English lit, maybe around that time. Um, But you might remember, probably the most famous protagonist in all of English lit is the main character. Anybody know who it is? It is, you didn't read, you didn't read it. Okay, Um, you might remember Pip. Okay, Pip is kind of the one that has great expectations. Uh, You didn't, okay, this illustration is going to fall flat. But let me just help you. Um, so Pip is, is like, like all of us. Pip becomes all of us. It's why it's such a classic piece of literature. He is going to go to the big city. He's going to make fame, you know, fortune. He's going to do all the things. He's going to marry Estella. And what happens is from his innocent childhood, we follow the story all the way to his really challenged, troubled adulthood. These great expectations are beat down over and over. He doesn't marry Estella. Uh, London is not this, you know, gold uh, streets of paradise. It's filthy. He doesn't make his fame and fortune. He's not a rich gentleman. He's a hardworking shipping agent in the end. And Pip becomes all of us. Great expectations met with reality, right? And I know that for many of us, we're going through a lot. That's why I wanted to guide us by his spirit. Just what are you going through right now? Because we all are. And I know the past few years in particular have done a number on a lot of us. Unmet expectations can beat us down and can cause us not only to diminish our faith, but it can decimate your prayer life. Expectation and faith go together. And some of us, frankly, have stopped praying as we should because we believe that God just hasn't answered my prayers. What are you waiting for these days? What challenges are you facing? And here's the big challenge for the week and for the month ahead. Are you praying with expectant prayer in these days? Because throughout this this, uh, season... We're going to be looking at the prayers of Christmas. The prayers of Christmas will be our focus. We're going to, we're going to expand our ability to pray in our, 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 our practice of prayer. We're going to look at listening prayers and, and, and uh, prayers of thanksgiving and prayers of celebration. We're going to, today, we're going to talk about the prayer of expectation. That's going to be our focus today. And what we're going to look at is this tension, sure enough, that we live in of unmet expectations and the reality of the challenges that we have, but the reality of the truth that God is with us and he calls us to continue to pray with great expectation. And so I I would ask you, are you living an expectant life in these days? How would you answer that honestly before the Lord? Are you anticipating great things from God? Because the moment we're in doesn't change the mission we're on. 
as a church family and as individuals in your life. Whatever you're facing, God is still at work, and we're going to see that today. So Ugran uh, Bultmann, he wrote a book called Theology of Hope. It's a book on eschatology, but he writes this, totally without hope, and you know this is true, one cannot live. To live without hope is to cease to live. He says, hell is hopelessness. It's no accident that over the entrance of Dante's hell is the inscription. You may have heard this. Leave behind all hope those who enter here. And some of us can slip into that kind of living. And yet, as disciples of Jesus, if you're a disciple of Jesus, if you've received his grace, we are to live with a daily hope, a living hope. And it is amplified and, it, and proclaimed at Christmas time, which is why we need to be all in to be reminded again. I want you to pause and consider do you live expectantly? Or is today a good day to say, I, I am so grateful, all of us, I have come to church today? Because with all the spiritual deconstruction that's taking place with so many today, it happens most often through unmet expectations. God ends up being someone you didn't anticipate him to be. Bad theology is what that was. Or someone that you looked up to, or a leader, someone in the church, a Christian, a person in your life, ended up being someone you did not anticipate them to be. Unmet expectations. How about this? Misplaced saviors. There's one who is faithful. And there's one that calls us to himself to be faithful as we think about these prayers of expectation. I want you to turn to the book of Luke. Uh, We're going to look at chapter 1. Luke 1, we're reading through Isaiah daily, but we're going to find ourselves here in Luke along the way as we look at the story of Christmas. And today we see, if you know, and and please, everyone turn to the book of Luke. Um, You have a Bible there in front of you because it's a long story and I'm not going to show you all the verses there. You can track along with me. Here, but he, he's putting together a, a compilation for the Honorable Theophilus because he has given to us uh, a summary. He says, I want you to be clear about what's happened among us. There's a lot that's being said, a lot being written, and I want to write it down. So Dr. Luke, very methodical, offers to us, and he puts in verse 5 there, he says, in the days of King Herod. Places it in historic context. There's a priest named Zechariah. He's one of 24 divisions of hundreds of priests. Now, we often think about the high priest, but there are hundreds of priests who are ministering, doing their work at the, at the temple, right? And so these divisions of priests come and they do their work. We know historically how this happened. Zechariah is called out to be a priest. He's married to Elizabeth. You may know that. These two, and, and these two are, I mean, godly, godly people as we'll see here. Now, spoiler alert, you know who they are parents of whom? Anybody? John the Baptist. Good, that's good. You know, you know scripture, you don't know great expectations. That's okay. Um, that's better, that's good. So A plus. Um, so John the Baptist, hey, you wanna know why John was called the greatest, Jesus said, among all men? Look at his parents. I mean, in part, now he's filled with the spirit from the time he is conceived. But in verse six, it says, righteous before God. We know that he's married to Elizabeth, who's, who's in this priestly line, the ironic priestly line, which is the line. These are two Jewish blue bloods, okay? And it says they're righteous before God, blameless in all the commandments and statutes before the Lord. Amazing couple. But then in verse seven, it says, but they had no child. And this is the kind of, wow, this is the kind of couple, imagine praying for years. Some of you know, praying for years to have children and they're thinking, we love you, Lord. We want to raise a child that would serve you all the days of their lives. How could this not be right? How could this not be your will? And many of our young couples have experienced this. Perhaps you have, many of us have experienced a season of fertility or maybe an inability to have children. And I want you to know, that if the story ended here, we would think this is a story of unmet expectations. It's a story of unanswered prayer. But I want to submit to you before we dive into the text, there's no such thing as unanswered prayer. Let's, let's remove that from our vocabulary. There's no such thing. 
No is a full sentence. Sometimes we pray and God says no. And even that is an act of faith, isn't it? To trust him in that. But Lord, here's what I want. And he says no. He, answered, he answers our prayers. Don't miss this. In many ways, no. Wait is not no. Wait. Timing's not right. Your request is not right. You're not right. Your motivation not right. But watch this. When your motivation's right, because you're walking with him, this is what we're going to see with Zechariah and Elizabeth, walking with him, obeying him, your prayers become aligned with his prayers. You pray according to his will. If the timing's right, you're right. The request is right. He answers your prayers 100% of the time in the affirmative. He answers all of our prayers, and it might be that we have to trust him that he knows better than we do. But do you see how much prayer is actually aligning? I think we get it wrong from the start, which is why many of us have stopped praying. We think, well, he doesn't answer prayer because we don't understand that prayer is as much aligning ourselves up with his will, asking for what he, is, what he wants to do, what he's doing in the world. The problem that many of us have in prayer is we're not praying what's on the heart of God. And yes, he cares about the small things. Lord, give me a parking place as I go to the mall here. I just need a parking place. Uh, Okay, okay. Or maybe, no, you need to walk a little more. You're out here. That would be good. (laughs) Are you praying in alignment with what God is doing in the world? How do I know? Scripture. That's why you're here today. How do I know what he's up to in the world? This is what we're going to see today. Because what happens is we believe that God is like the Amazon man in the sky. I click this. It showed up. Click this. It's happening. And he he is greater. He is wiser. He's, He's sovereign over us. He knows better than we do. You can trust him. And so the point here in all of this, as I set this up, is out of a a constant walking with God, we're praying and we don't stop praying. Keep on praying, okay? That's the point, because here we're going to see expectant prayer rises out of a pattern of life with God, okay? This is a phrase I'm going to use over and over again. And then we're going to also see that, that, that this, this expectant prayer requires a partnership with God. And, and, and expectant prayer, okay, results in a proclamation with God, what he's doing, And what he's done in the world. Look at verse 8. Okay, follow along with me now. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, okay, there it is all set up. By the way, they they said, okay, this happens twice a day, that he is going in to light, to burn the incense, the candle of incense, um, which represents the, it symbolizes the prayers of the people, God's people. According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot, this is strange to us, to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Out of hundreds of priests, how did they choose the one that would be chosen to go in and light this holy? He would go into, not the Holy of Holies, but inside another the, you know, outer, outer court where the people are out praying. He goes in, he lights the candle of incense. How was he chosen? Not by the people, by God. He was chosen by God in this moment. Some said that that a priest might do this once or twice in a lifetime. He's chosen by God. Look at this, verse 10. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. There's a moment. They all gather around. Again, he's praying consistently for the people of Israel on behalf of the people. And there appeared to him, verse 11, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. Nobody's supposed to be in there but him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, right? The number one command in scripture, Zechariah, he calls him by name, for you, your prayer has been heard. And look at this, prayers of the people, yes, but mingled in those prayers throughout his life, your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. Wow. 
while Zechariah is pursuing life with God, his prayers are rising up to God, and he has this bold prayer of expectancy. Imagine, he's been praying this for decades. And I am sure there were times he gave up hope. He decided this is just not going to happen, but he continued to pray. The first thing I want you to see as you take notes here, expectant prayer rises out of a pattern of life with God. Like incense that rises up, sweet aroma, Psalm 141, 2 says, sweet aroma are the prayers of God's people coming to him. This is an ancient practice all the way back to Exodus, praying. And I just imagine all of us praying constantly for our church family. Sweet aroma coming to God. Are you praying expectant prayers? They will come out of a pattern. You know, you're going to eat lunch today. Probably. You're going to eat later today. You might get some exercise this week. You might not. You may go to work. We do things daily. If you pray daily and consistently, constantly, even when you don't feel like praying, God is going to show up and out of those prayers, a pattern of a life with him are these unexpected and, and yes, expectant prayers that you're praying, bold prayers for people around you. And this is what he's doing. This past Monday night, our deacons gathered for uh, uh, a, a deacons meeting. Gathered together, we, we worship, we talk about what's happening in the church. Rodney Shell, our executive pastor, whom you heard from earlier, he was challenging our deacons to go back to October 22nd, a day when we were casting vision about all that God's doing here. And he asked this question, what would it look like to be all in as leaders in our church, servant leaders in the church? This is a question for all of us. What does it look like to be all in for you? And he offered this, this challenge. If we are not praying bold prayers for our church family, for God to move and for our church to grow, to reach more and more people, make disciples and change our city and the world. If we're not praying bold prayers for our church family, who will? If you're not praying for people in your connect group who are in need, who will? Closer to home. If you're not praying for people in your family, if you're married, let's say a spouse, who is? If you're not praying for your children, bold prayers, who will? Praying for your grandchildren, praying for your roommate, praying for friends in need. If you're not praying, friends, this is convicting. If we're not praying, who is going to do this? We're not praying for our nation. Who is going to pray? He's praying for the nation. He's in a pattern of prayer. And out of this comes expectant prayers, bold prayers for God to move. An old man and an old woman being faithful to God, praying for a child to be born, still praying. I've said it before. The number one reason for unanswered prayer Prayerlessness. Are you praying? Let this challenge you. Expect that prayer rises up out of life with God. And yes, there's doubt and there's faith that intermix. And for some of us, maybe your prayer today is Mark 9, 24. Let it echo forth. Let it be the prayer of the man who, who praying for his son. Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Sounds like a paradoxical prayer, doesn't it? Doubt and faith can coexist. How can you pray for something and you don't have faith? I need more faith. That's a legit prayer. Pray it. And God says that, yes, 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 yes. This is sweet aroma. You come to me. Come to me. He longs for you to come to him. What do you need to be praying for in this season? That's the key question today. What bold prayers do you need to be praying in this season. And could it be that like me, devote yourself daily to a bold prayer, a singular prayer, perhaps every day throughout the Advent season, all the way through December to be praying a particular prayer all month long. Maybe you are literally wrestling with infertility. And I would just want to say it explicitly. We have a group we have, we have ministry. We have, we have support for you. 
And you can just find me after the service and I can direct you to folks, young couples who are walking through this together. Because it's hard. But can you imagine an older couple through decades of, of trying and, and they're still praying. Every child is a gift from God. But watch this. For 400 years, God's been silent. And then he speaks. He speaks to an old man married to an older woman who had been faithful for decades and they're still serving God. And he shows up and he says, you're my guy. Zechariah, you're the man. Friends, there are so many in our church today. So many of our senior adults, our wise ones among us, mature ones that all of us can look at and look to and say, they're still serving the Lord. They're still hearing from him and they're proclaiming his greatness. And so what happens in verse 14, track along with me through 18, we see that he's going to be set apart. He has the spirit of power, the power of Elijah, who also called the people back to repent and come back to God. Be ready. Verse 17, it says he's going to make ready for the Lord. I love this. A prepared people, a people prepared for the Messiah to come. We can pray for God to move. We can prepare our hearts. We can expect him to move. What can we expect him to do? Think about that, expectant prayers. You can expect him. When you pray for him to move in your life, he will. When you pray for him to bring comfort in your anxiety, he will. You can pray that his presence will not leave you, he will answer that in the affirmative. You see, we pray according to his will. He empowers us. He gives us spirit and power to live the life he's called us to. You want to to overcome sin. You want to be like Jesus. He will give you the power to do so. See, the problem in our day, many Christians want to see Christianity permeate our society. But many don't want Christ to pervade and permeate their hearts. Those are two different things. Or they're connected in this way. As he does permeate our hearts, as we live in the way of Jesus, that's how we change society. That's how the kingdom comes into the world. And we can pray, Lord, help me to be that kind of person. And don't miss this. Through it all, prayer is not simply, again, coming to him like he's the great vending machine, the Amazon man in the sky. Instead, Prayer, we come to him to get him, not all that he can give to us. We come into his presence, that's success. And he says, yes, you come, you come. But let's be honest. Many of us are in a season of waiting and longing. I've already talked to someone this morning who says, okay, what do you do though when, I have a friend who says, God just doesn't answer my prayers. How do you, how do you deal with that? So we, we talked about that for a moment. And, and I just want you to know, if you're among people who really are struggling in prayer, you're not alone. And if you're struggling in this, um, th- this, this unmet you know, expectations, and all of us are in varying degrees, you're, you're not alone. In fact, the great reformer Martin Luther wrote about this. Uh, he called it uh, the soul struggle. Enfektugen is the German word. It's like the dark night of the soul. You've heard that phrase before. Spiritual depression. That's what it is. Many have struggled with it. You may not know. C.S. Lewis wrote about this. Mother Teresa, Charles Spurgeon. I mean, great Christian, uh, Dr. Martin Lowe Jones, Jones, if you know who that is. I mean, great believe. I think Paul struggled with this. I think maybe, maybe we all have in varying degrees because we live in the tension of the already and the not yet. Expectant, yes, but not yet. And then it seems like unmet expectations. Call it what you will. It's this longing that Paul talked about. It's in our DNA, and then we struggle with it maybe even more as we come closer to Christ. The world's not the way it ought to be. And so we're longing for more. Call it spiritual depression. Call it the dark night of the soul. Some of you call it a hot mess. Whatever it is for you, in the midst of it all, of struggle and disappointment, know this, God is with you. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. You can keep coming to him. And that's success. Look at verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? Catch the question. How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And then look at verse 19. 
For the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. He's like, how will I know this? Hey, let me tell you who I am. <laughs> let me tell you, I am here, but I'm sent by God. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you good news, to bring you euangelion. I have good news for you. And he's scared to death, right? Here's what we know about Gabriel. He's in the Old and New Testament. One of two angels, we actually know his name. Anybody know the other one? What? Michael, let's go, A plus again. Um, Now here's what we know about Gabriel. He looks like a man, scares people to death. (laughs) And brings good news. He's going to come to Mary. You know that, right? He's active here in the Christmas story. He comes and then look at what it says. He's saying, I'm from God. So listen to me. And behold, verse 20, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Like, I mean, first reading, this sounds kind of harsh, right? Like, how, wait, how will I know this is going to happen? Bam. Okay, you're not going to speak anymore. This sounds harsh, right? Until you understand the question. He asked, how shall I know this? He's asking for a sign. It's not, not like Mary. How will this be? I'm a virgin. He's, ask, he's asking for a sign. And look at this. The sign is you're going to be mute. You can't speak. And watch this. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized, there it is. They knew because of the sign that he'd seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them because he couldn't speak and remain mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went home. Silenced by the presence of the Lord speaking to him. Now, yes, there's, a, there's an element of this that is disobedience. I mean, uh, delayed obedience is disobedience. That's, that's the answer. Or how about this? Not only is, the, is, is, is muteness, okay, he becomes mute. Um, that's an act of grace. You want a sign? Here it is. And not only is he mute, he's deaf. I don't know if you've ever caught this before, but in verse 62 later, they're making signs to him. So he can't hear and he can't speak. And later he's going to write on a tablet, if you know this story, because he can't hear or speak. And so watch this. For 400 years, God has been silent. He can't hear from outside of himself and he can't speak. And God says, I'm using you to break the silence. But not yet. You see what's happening there? What he's doing here, here's the next thing I want you to see. Expectant prayer requires a partnership with God. That's that's where he gets tripped up. And and in fact, have you ever done this before? God answers his prayer and then he has doubts. He's had faith, Lord, do this, do this. God says, I'm doing it. But really? How many of us have done that? Lord, I need a new job. He says, give me a new job. Bam, here's a new job. The door opens and you go, eh. I don't, I don't think so. And the Lord's going, what do you want? Right? And I know it takes wisdom to discern all those things, but it's interesting. Sometimes God answers our prayers and then we still struggle to believe. That's what's happening here. God wants us to experience the joy of partnering with him. That's what the Christian life is all about. So then later on, we see in verse 39, this is a longer story here. We're going to look at Mary, the Magnificat. In verse 41, we see the very first person to recognize the long-awaited unborn Messiah is an unborn child. Don't miss that. John announces Jesus' arrival in utero. He's already doing the work filled with the Spirit before he's ever born. Elizabeth, about six months ahead of Mary, the Magnificat comes. In in, in verse 57, John is born. And naming him after Zechariah is what everybody anticipates. But instead, he writes on a tablet. You see it in verse 63. His name is John. And in this moment, now he's saying, this is what, it's not me. It's not about me. It's about God. He said the name is John. And I'm going to name him John. It's an act of submission and and, and an act of, I'm, I'm in, I'm in. And immediately he can speak. 
And wow, does he speak. Look at verse 67. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying. Okay, now, verse 68 through 79 is a single sentence. It's one sentence in the Greek. And it's called the Benedictus. The, in Latin, it's the Vulgate, the translation of Latin. Bene, Benedictus, which means blessed. It's the first word. Blessed or praised. Okay? It, it, praise be to God. Because what happens here is, look at this, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation, the authority of God on the move here, the, the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. What he's saying here is, I'm joining now this line of prophets, a continuation of God's plan throughout all of redemptive history. So he points out the line of David. He goes on, he mentions Abraham, the promise of Abraham. This is the redemptive plan of God. The expectant prayer rises up out of a pattern of a life with God. It, it, it comes as a, a result or, or a, a, a walking with God along the way. And what happens is to, look at this, it results in proclamation with God. It results in a proclamation. Our prayers are answered, I can say it this way, not for us, ultimately, but for God. To the glory of God, look at verse 76, a pattern of praise. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby, this is beautiful, this is a song, really lyrics, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is so beautiful. Look at this. The sunrise of the kingdom of God is inaugurated in the birth of Jesus. John, yes, will come forth, eclipsed by the light of the world. We sang about it earlier. The light that has come to men. The life that is Jesus that has come to us. So look at this. Expectant prayer rises out of a pattern of life with God. It, it, it demands, it requires a partnership with God. This is what all of the Christian life is. It's what prayer is. And it results in the proclamation with God of what he's doing in, in our world. Ze uh, Zechariah, he knew what God was up to. How did he know? He knew scripture. We say it always. You got to be in the word daily. Every member of our church and guests join us. You can read the scriptures, the dwell reading every day, along with the word from uh, different ones. And you can then, after Christmas, here's, here's the guide, after Christmas, to stay in the word daily and to walk with him. That's how we know. The Benedictus ends in verse 75. And what I want to challenge you with is this. Let your hopes, what you identified earlier, let your hopes, not, not your losses, not your unmet expectations, not your pain. Let your hopes and what you know is true determine your future. Not your struggles. We should be the most optimistic people on the planet because the Lord is at work and he's already come among us. And I'll land it with this. The question I want us to ask is this. How will you trust God while you wait? That's the question I want to close with. How will you trust God while you wait? Because in the end, this is not a story about Zechariah. This is a story about God and what he's up to in the world. So if you're one who's given up on prayer, could it be that you are not praying for the things that are on the heart of God? Your prayers have turned inward. They've become selfish. They have become so, so weak. And instead, he's calling you to pray bold prayers. Bold prayers for your church family, for your connect group, for people you know and love. He's calling us to pray bold prayers, friends. And we can do that. We can pray expectantly because he is on the move in our world and he's on the move in your life.
This is the story of Jesus. The horn of salvation has come to set us free and he never disappoints. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. This amazing story of this amazing couple. And we thank you for examples that we have throughout our church family. Lord, we wouldn't have otherwise. And what a beautiful thing that you have, have created the church where we can come together with people we wouldn't normally maybe come together with. We wouldn't know across generations to know of your great work among us. Lord, thank you for the church. Oh, for the love that you have for us and for the love that we have for one another. Lord, how I praise you for our church family. I thank you for how you're moving among us. You are not finished with us, and we are so grateful. But Lord, I pray that each of us would pray bold prayers in the days to come, daily, and you'll move mightily among us. And friend, if you're here today in this prayer, this moment, the greatest prayer of expectation you can pray, if you've never received Christ, the most bold prayer you can pray is to say, Lord, come into my heart, change my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I submit my life to you. Give him your life today. Lord, we give you all glory. And we praise you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.